Welcome back. This Sunday, the World Bank released a report predicting a four degree increase in Earth's temperature and outlining why this outcome must be avoided. Even with all the current mitigation pledges fully implemented, says the World Bank, there is a one in five chance of this catastrophic increase occurring by the year 2100, possibly in the lifetime of our children, possibly even in ours. The report makes for terrifying reading, especially in conjunction with the World Energy Outlook report released nine days ago by the International Energy Agency. That report too paints a bleak picture. Energy use and costs will soar, and the relatively simple fixes like increasing energy efficiency in all sectors will remain mostly unaddressed unless wide-reaching policy changes are introduced and enforced. This is not a drill. If the conversation previously was about protecting our way of life, it must now be about the survival of the species. How do we address the multitude of separate but connected environmental challenges, most of which we have brought upon ourselves? How do we connect this struggle in a time of resource scarcity to the cause of global justice? Can we save the world for everybody? Please welcome to Crosstalks. Johan Rockström, Professor in Natural Resource Management at Stockholm University and Executive Director of Stockholm Resilience Centre. Assistant Professor Åsa Moberg, Head of the Division of Environmental Strategies Research at KTH, Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. And Dr. Sarah Cornell, Research Scientist and Coordinate Coordinator for Planetary Boundaries at the Stockholm Resilience Centre at Stockholm University. Welcome to Crosstalk. Thank you. Johan Rockström, could you please start uh, with summarizing the state of the world uh, right now? Well, you just did. <laughs> but I think the, the scientific message to humanity is that there is so much evidence to now show that we're in trouble. And the reason why there's deep reason for concern is that until very recently, the human pressures on the Earth system, not only emissions of greenhouse gases, but the way we deal with biodiversity, deforestation, overfishing, etc., has largely been you know, absorbed and dampened by the planet. The planet has been our best friend. It's taking our punches, but actually absorbing and reducing the impacts. Now we start seeing the evidence for the first time that the planet may be going from being our best friend to becoming an enemy, to self-reinforce negative change. So the planet can never go to four degrees unless it, it sort of says self-reinforced warming. For example, when the Arctic melts, it changes color from a white surface that reflects incoming solar radiation and becomes a darker surface that absorbs energy. That is the kind of nervous dynamics which we scientists now try to communicate. And that's why there's reason to be really concerned of the predicament for humanity. That's why we need to change very rapidly towards a sure safer what future. Nervous dynamic means. Does it mean unpredictable? It means that we have always assumed, and we've built up our societies on the assumption, that everything from forests to wetlands to the atmosphere changes very, very gradually, linearly, and therefore in a predictable way. Now we're learning that nature is very different. It's full of surprise. There's abrupt changes where things can change very slowly over a long period, which it has done for the past thousand years but then it can cross tipping points and start changing very abruptly and often in an irreversible way, negatively with regards to our own development. Because the media still offer, I'm ashamed to say, quite a lot of space to climate skeptics. I should ask, you say the more we learn, the less we realize we know in some ways. Is there still some kind of possibility that this is all just a huge mistake and none of these threats are actually going to happen? I think that the following can actually be argued to be an, ob an objective, fact-based statement that science today can speak with one voice with regards to the risks of unsustainable human pressures on the planet. Because it's not only about climate change, it's also about land degradation, overuse of fresh water, the way we pollute our rivers with nutrients, with chemicals, the way we pollute our air, the way we reduce our biodiversity. And all of these things are interlinked. It's, it's incredibly important to understand that the largest impact on our climate may in fact in the very near future not be our emission of greenhouse gases, but the way we manage our biosphere, our ecosystems on land and the oceans. So there's so much evidence that we're taking enormous risks. So I would argue that there's no so say, argument to be made anymore from a skeptical point of view with regards to the need for a major transition towards a sustainable future to be sure about development in the future. Sarah Cornell, I was curious about your title. 
could you translate for us first what planetary boundaries means and how you coordinate them? And second, <laughs> why your workplace is called a resilience center rather than something, something, sustainability, something? Yes. <laughs> I need to be very clear to begin with that I'm coordinating research on planetary <laughs> boundaries, not, oh, unfortunately, not the whole planet. <laughs> um, we've had about 40 years of research in a field that is now called Earth System Science. That's how we understand the world as a set of interacting components and thinking of Earth as a system has been a really fruitful way of understanding environmental change, both human and biophysical. And like Johan was saying, the, this research field has given us a real understanding into how the Earth works what it does and how it operates, what the mechanisms are and what the controls on change are. Um, and we've got a really good understanding now of the patterns of change. And so from the point of view of sustainability, there's been a lot of discussion over, oh, centuries of how we might use up resources and it's treated them as fixed quantities. And I think, you know, we still need to be aware of resource constraints um, in, in some areas. But for sustainability, it's become really important that we understand these patterns of change because they also present constraints for human activity. Mm. And just the same as running out of stuff um, is an such unpleasant situation, such as oil. Yeah. And I mean, you know, there's plenty of other minerals Water, and resources that we might, yeah. um, we might want to think of in terms of constraint or depletion. We also need to think about these dynamics because as you were saying, they, they present constraints for us. There's a, um, some of them are predictable. Some of them we can't predict, but we can explain. And being able to use that understanding of how we can explain change helps us to understand a little bit about how we need to tackle sustainability. So what are planetary boundaries? Planetary boundaries are a, a way of constraining human activity one step away from these thresholds. We, sh we, we hope that we'll be able to use and bring together enough scientific knowledge about the thresholds and about areas where there's rapid change and irreversible change. So there's limits and we're not meant to go abroad over those limits. Those are the boundaries. If we cross those boundaries, bad, bad things will happen. If we cross the boundaries, we increase the risk of bad things happening. And mm -hmm. I think this is, there's two elements here. One is for the issues where we've got certainty. Um, we just want to set fixed boundaries. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, we've got policies that tell us not to do certain things. I mean, one really good example that we have from recent history is we have stopped putting um, freons into the atmosphere because of what they were doing to ozone in the upper atmosphere. Mm. Um, and that was a physical and chemical threshold change. Mm. Um, and a boundary makes perfect sense. People don't argue about that yeah. sort of behavior. Um, for some of the others, we've got many more interconnections. It's not Can quite as simple. Can you just mention simple. a few so we have some idea what they um, could be? The most, in some ways, the sort of most overarching one of them is the climate system, which in itself isn't just the physics of ocean and atmosphere. Mm. Although in, in our work in the Stockholm Resilience Center and internationally, um, we're we focus mainly on greenhouse gases and radiative forcing for mm. climate as a shorthand for everything else that climate does. Well, like Yuan was mentioning earlier too, biodiversity, changing nutrient cycles of phosphorus and nitrogen. Mm. We fix nitrogen um, in industrial processes to use as fertilizers, and that trails through landscapes and water. Um, and coastal zones and causes so damage. So, what about well. sweet water? Is that is that one of those as well? Water is mm. another one. Mm. And to be, to be land use, some areas of land, you know, kind of as we appropriate more and more land, again, it becomes a very important shorthand for everything that land does. Ah. And okay. I'm just trying. I'm just trying to <laughs> really like make this comprehensible on a very sort of practical mm. level. But basically, the planetary boundaries would be the, the sort of limits within which we have to stay on every kind of system that we're currently breaking. Yes, we can talk yes. about it like that. We're trying to yeah. define the safe operating space using the best available science about the risks as we move out into thresholds of change. But obviously, deciding what safe is, 
is a is an area where science needs to actively engage much more broadly yes. with society and with decision exactly. makers and with the people who make. So them. you're both from the resilience centre. Yes. So what's what's that? Sustainability versus resilience. Is there a short answer? Oh yes. <laughs> you know, sustainability is always good. Resilience can be bad. That's a difference. I don't understand. <laughs> Help me out here. Of course. Again. <laughs> well, one, one example. Well, resilience is, is defines for a society or an ecosystem its ability to take a shock or disturbance while remaining in the same structure, remaining in a desired state. Without so, breaking. So it's, so it's the amount of pressure you can take without breaking. That's why, for example, the, the Mugabe regime in Zimbabwe has proven to be quite resilient, but that's not sustainable. Uh -huh. So that's a difference. But what we're learning is that in a world where things are changing so fast, and where we have a much higher frequency of, of shocks and disturbances from pandemics, financial crisis, and droughts and floods, you need to build resilient societies, and that ecosystems and nature plays a role in delivering strong cities, strong societies, and that is a measure of resilience. It's ability to provide human well-being in a world that is changing. So it's a component of sustainability, but a very important one, which we have so far mm -hmm. very you know, limited understanding of, and we haven't really prioritized it. I, I turn also more to you with hope at this point as, as representative of the sort of engineering end of all of this. Many citizens out there uh, have, have read in the media that we don't need to worry about the, the environment because scientific innovation will solve the problems as we get to them. Uh, is that correct? I'm asking here in the library at, at, the, at the Royal Institute of Technology, is that wishful thinking? And if so, to what degree? Well, of course, we, we got here, so I guess we could have solved it before if, if that would be the case. And oh. I would say, of course, there is scientific innovation and new technology which will help solve environmental problems, but there are also new uh, innovations and technology which will lead to more environmental problems. And as you said in the introduction also, there are already many possible energy efficiency solutions which are not put into practice because of lack of policy and so on. So there's more needed to actually uh, put, put the, like, the right technology there and you also need to use it and, and uh, implement it in, in a certain way. So it's not, we need technology and innovation, but we need more uh, as well. I'm, I'm grasping for, for straws here a little bit. I, I feel like I just need a little hope. So, okay, for my generation, we look to the internet as the answer for everything. And I, I know you've done research in information and communication technology specifically. Surely, surely there is some hope just in the fact that we can transmit knowledge and new understanding very fast now. Yeah, we, we look at, we try to look for uh, information and communication solutions for sustainable development. And there are potential for ICT solutions to, to provide uh, f for environmental uh, improvements and so on but also here it's uh, there are uh, pros and cons that if, if we provide for new solutions which will make uh, perhaps uh, distribution of goods more efficient that you can uh, lo logistics of, of trucks and so on you will have improvements for those uh, leading to less uh, greenhouse gas emissions the, this will lead to uh, a lower price for distributing goods and then you will increase the, the transportation so there's mm -hmm. might be these direct effects which are positive and then you might have indirect effects due to uh, lower prices or that you get more time or so on so you, so you always have a difficulty there where you need to also put policy in there or, or other uh, regulations or so on to, to uh, make this potential potential mm. of ICT uh, move towards sustainable development so mm. did you want to come next no I oh. was just enthusiastically nodding because I think these are uh, there's we've had a lot of discussions with people who listen to what we're saying about the science and who argue, I mean, who don't believe it. And I think this question of what we believe starts to come in. And obviously, as scientists, we like to think that what we believe is true and it's out there in some way. Um, but really recognizing that there are people who believe that technology can fix all ills. Um, it does present us with a lot of challenges. And I, I, um, I, I I think that it brings us back. I mean, I like the way you brought the policy issue in, because one of the things for us is 
technology isn't uh, a sort of an overarching force out there that, that determines the destiny of the world. Mm -hmm. it, we make choices about it. And I think that, you know, we make choices as individuals, we make choices as, as governments and nations. And it really annoys me that I haven't thought of the argument that you said before, well, the technology development is what put us here in the be to begin with. <laughs> yes. Well, that's yes, right. So, but that's a se that's also, that also says something about the um, incredibly, how, how the technology optimism is so ingrained uh, in us that we wouldn't think of it in those terms. At the same time, sure, like, that is the way we're going to have to go. It's going to be innovation uh, and, and technical development that's going to provide the answers. I'd, I'd just like to return for a moment still uh, to specifically the climate change issue, because you were saying before, as, as we were talking before, that even, even this four degree um, prediction is considered to be quite conservative in some places, and the World Bank is that kind of an, an organization that isn't going to give you the most horrifying numbers. You, might have a, you might be, be be worried that it's going to be even much worse. Could we just talk about the specifics of that? So, so a two degree change. Everybody agrees that a two degree change has already happened. That's irreversible, or maybe reversible, but certainly it's it's something that will definitely happen. What does a four degree increase mean, regardless of whether this happens in our lifetime or in our children's lifetime? Johan, for instance, what yeah. on a practical level, what does that mean? Yeah, I, I think it's it's important here to begin with, to say that there is scientific uncertainty with regards to how far the temperature will rise. But interestingly, there's not so much uncertainty with regards to the levels of danger with different temperature levels, because we have oh. so much record in the paleoclimatic data record of how it was to be on Earth at different temperature levels. So we know with quite good certainty that two degrees is very dangerous, already two degrees. So it's not a coincidence that the world actually accepted in the end that dangerous climate change begins at two degrees. In fact, most low-lying island states in the world refuses to accept two degrees because already at one and a half degrees, we'll probably lose the Maldives and most of the low-lying island nations because the sea level will rise beyond one meter already at one and a half degrees. So one should remember that already two degrees is something we will have to put immense amounts of investments to adapt to. Wait, wait, I just, so when we, when we move to four, we're in the domain of catastrophic change. I, I, one has to be very, very clear about what these different temperature rises mean. So I'm, I'm just going to stop you there. If we're talking about the, the two degree change that has already happened. No, so no, no, that hasn't happened. No, that, that will already we're, have happened, so to say. We've already yeah. caused it. It hasn't yet happened. Correct. It will happen we've, probably we've, within the next hundred years or? That's right. Almost I mean, definitely within the next hundred years. Correct. So that means that all of those island nations are pretty much gone. Well, you see, there is one beauty with climate change, which is that you pump out greenhouse gases, you can, in fact, take them out again. You could, for example, use nature to start getting carbon dioxide back into the soil if you use photosynthesis in an effective way connected to bioresource into energy systems like we do in Sweden. So, I mean, there is a, a little window to backtrack on some. So you could actually have an overshoot and then go back into a safe operating space, as, uh, as Sarah pointed out. But you're right that we're largely committed to two degrees. So we're largely committed to a very difficult future. The key is not to allow to go beyond that because that's where you get these abrupt changes, the tipping points that Sarah pointed out. And then, then we're a domain where what happens, well, what happens is that we'll get large parts of the world not able to produce food anymore. We'll have a collapse of all the marine coral systems in the world. We'll be in for largely a three, four, five meter sea level rise. And we'll have you know, heat waves and extreme weather events, which way surpass what we have as extremes today. So we'll have you know, major turbulence and shocks uh, across the world. And, and that is the kind of future that, I mean, humanity wouldn't be extinct. The question is, can such a world support 9 billion people in a good way? <coughs> and the answer is no, of and course. And the science, scientific answer to that is no. So I'm, I'm just, I'm sorry, I, I, I know all this stuff and I'm still, I can't quite deal with it at this time. I'm just going to take another participant in this conversation. Jo no, groin, joining us on Skype, I think, is Matthias Klum. Hello. Hello. Hello, Matthias. An award-winning Swedish photographer and film producer who has covered natural history and culture topics for over 25 years in over 100 countries. Hello, Matthias. As you travel the world, how much of these change processes are visible to you today? Well, um, most of them are. I mean, you don't have to go uh, very far to 
to see changes. I've worked a lot in tropical regions. I worked a lot with uh, melting glaciers and going back and forth to some of these hidden realms. Um, it's very easy to see drastic uh, anthropogenic change. Anthropogenic means caused by people. Or, Correct. Yes. I, I, the mission of your company, Tierra Grande, is to embody the beauty, fragility and the threats found in our world today to inform, educate and inspire people to act towards a sustainable tomorrow. I like it that you made it so poetic. Uh, how do we inspire people to act when the truth is so terrifying we are resisting even comprehending it? Well, that's a Nobel laureate uh, question for you. I mean, it's very hard, obviously, to, to give a, one simple answer to that. But I do believe, being a, a merely a filmmaker and photographer, that by working together with leading scientists, which I'm privileged to do, not least with Professor Rockström, I, I, I try to use photography and storytelling to um, bridge the gap between uh, intellectual, empirical evidence, and heartfelt uh, art. Basically, you know, what, what photography, music, and, and the arts in general can do is uh, to communicate very powerful things in a way that really gets into people heart, people's hearts. Mm -hmm. So uh, I find that very essential. I, the burden is so very heavy. And we are all individually so very small. Um, how much responsibility should we all individually feel for what is, or take? I mean, feeling and taking perhaps isn't the same. We're going to feel very responsible, perhaps. And, or I guess that's the question. Should, how responsible should we feel, and how much responsibility should we take? Well, may I just add one thing? Sure. I, I feel that it's very important on an individu individual basis to to um, uh, start some kind of a personal individual audit, regardless if we're Angela Merkel or our prime minister in Sweden or uh, all of us on, on crosstalks. Mm. Um, because when we do that, we can basically reboot our, our lives uh, at, at a certain, in, in a way, and, and uh, really try to affect change. And when you get this across to decision makers in society, you get this across to uh, people uh, on all walks of life, uh, it, it really starts uh, a powerful, uh, you know, you get people start on, on, a, on a journey where they have been, perhaps. Uh, and and I, I don't say this to say that it, it's that simple. We obviously need legislation, we need structure, we need strategies, but if we don't get the mind shift and the paradigm shift needed, um, it's very hard to, to, to get anything done. So what's your answer? Every person in this room, including us, what, how much should we carry ourselves of this? Yeah, no, thank you. I mean, I, let, let, let me put a challenge <laughs> to you. Well, to begin with, I mean, of course, I agree with Matthias. I mean, Matthias and I just, just wrote a book called The Human Quest, where one of the key conclusions is exactly that everyone can do a lot. But, you know, the changes that we face are so large, we, we need nothing less than a, than a revolution. I mean, if we're going to meet a fossil fuel free world in just 40 years to avoid the, the dangers of four degrees, I believe we need to connect both the innovation and the engagement and the responsibility from us as individuals with a very, very clear top-down leadership from, from business leaders and, and the, the heads of state in the world. And I would, the challenge I would put is that I think today that if you would ask a question to the CEOs of the 200 largest companies in the world, if they would accept a global carbon tax, I would challenge you that they will all answer yes. But there's not one political leader in this world that is willing to adopt a global carbon tax. So I think today we have a political leadership that is kind of misgaging the willingness of us as individuals and the willingness of the private sector to actually move. And I think that's the connection that we should be talking about in, in crosstalks and other mm. uh, kind of scenes like this, because there's, there's, a, there's a possibility now to move faster if we could just connect, I think particularly business, and innovation with, with political leadership. Also, were you? Yeah, I totally agree. With the uh, companies we work with and par partnering companies, I get the feeling too yeah. that they would like to have more push from, from policy to yeah. actually 
be able to also go, f go for their uh, technologies, which could be better for environment and so on, to, to actually uh, have their plan mm. uh, for the future in, in a new direction. Because but of course they would, wouldn't go for that plan if they didn't know that policy right. would also... But is, is, is your feel from about the private sector that they do need to be regulated, that they do need to be shoved, regulated and perhaps government investments as well and these kinds of things? Or is there an understanding that this is pretty much a life and death situation for everybody so they could just go ahead and do it anyway? Well, I, I, I don't know that, but, but uh, I, I think, of course, if you want to make a long-term plan for your business, you would like to, to have some... Uh, what you say, uh, s some knowledge about where uh, regulation and policy are going so that mm. you don't go that direction and then, then you lo lose all the support and you don't, you don't feel that, that you get the incentives, monetary and so on. So, of course, that would uh, make this happen in another way. But how do we, I mean, because now we're connecting, at the end of the previous talk, we were just uh, arriving at this mm. same thing. It some, somehow ultimately becomes a question about political mandate, and that bounces back to us, mm. us the citizens. Mm. I turn to you with this. How do we communicate? Uh, what would that require? How, how many, I don't know, how many percent of the population should have to do something, and what would that be? I don't know, sorry. I think one of the things that I find really enjoyable about the last... 15 years or so that I've been thinking about sustainability is just how much is actually happening in communities. And again, I think mm. there's something about, you know, it's becoming much more visible through things like the internet. Um, people haven't waited to be told what to do by government. There's a huge amount of work all around the world on local food systems and improving local transport choices. Um, I'm thinking of, you know, walking buses for school children and, you know, things that didn't exist when I was a kid. And this is happening all around the world. We were at the Rio Plus 20 conference in the summer. And one of the most, in fact, probably the most enjoyable aspects of that was just how much community activity was happening in the corridors. Never mind the discussions that were happening in the big chambers. The real enthusiasm and energy were these... The, the linking together from people from all around the world doing exactly the same thing, recycling clothes. And like I say, food systems is going to be an incredibly important issue as we try to feed 9 billion people in, I, I, in 50 years. I, I have a follow-up on this. I should just um, explain to those who are now sitting there wondering, what's a walking bus? A walking school <laughs> bus is instead of for the kids taking a bus to, to school for safety reasons, you just walk around and pick them up and then they walk to school together hand in hand as a, in a little... As a little it's called a crocodile in Sweden, ah. sure. <laughs> as in a, as a little uh, group of children together with adult supervision. Yes. Uh, so it's, it's interesting that you would use the word enjoyable because the rest of us are still <laughs> there with terror. So are you, in general, hopeful about us solving this? <laughs> well, I, th I think, I think yes. there are a couple of, of elements, <laughs> even evidence to suggest that there is reason for hope. I mean, the, the window is shutting, but mm -hmm. it's still open. And, and one is, of course, the, the fundamental point that Matthias pointed out, that, you know, I don't think there's one human being on this planet that deliberately want to destroy the planet. Mm. I think there's a, there's a deep, deep universal value connecting us humans with nature. But I think we've disconnected ourselves. We've allowed ourselves to disconnect ourselves because we somehow, you know, the economist wrote quite recently that it's so good that the world is urbanizing because then our <laughs> dependence on agriculture actually reduces. What? <laughs> well, where, you know, what will we eat? Exactly, this? what will we eat? concrete but but you know there's there's this there's this disconnect and somehow we need to use new ways of communicating new ways you know we scientists are not very good at communicating but if you connect science with arts with new alliances of stakeholders from civil society culture technology business i think we have new ways of going to scale and using ict for example as a way of really reaching out to what you could call a kind of a global campaign when we reconnect to the biosphere i think that's one issue but the other one is that also pointed out earlier that you know, there's so much evidence that things are moving. Look at the world's fourth largest economy, Germany. You know, Angela America's biggest problem now is that renewable energy is going too fast. It's actually surpassing all the, the projections. They'll have more than 50% wind and solar by 2020. That, well, that's what we hear, but we also read in the papers that they're opening coal, they're, they're, they're moving back to coal as a way to bridge the gap to when 
to when the renewable resources happen. Is that o not correct? Overall, that's not correct. Overall, they're moving very decisively towards renewable energy. Mm -hmm. They're moving faster than planned. Of course, they have kind of base energy challenges that they need to deal with in a transition period. But they're starting to show, in fact, that you can run a modern economy with good welfare on renewable energy. That's very promising. If we're looking at some, a lot of this seems to be about short term versus long term thinking. So we have a political conflict which is getting reelected versus survival of the species. And there I'm pretty sure that everybody who isn't on the side of me living should probably not be in office. I mean, everybody living, but I mean, <laughs> if we all just vote on that principle, uh, people who are refusing to move will be out of office pretty fast. But then also economic conflicts, as we were talking about before, immediate profits versus long term survival. And the thing is, very few companies have a have a plan, a vision, even for the next 30 years. Very few companies in the new industries have, have a vision even for the next year, as it happens, uh, and let alone the, the next 130 years or something. That's the time scale we need to be, to be looking at here. So I see that's as a real sort of mind shift problem in the private sector. And I, I look to you for guidance. You don't look as you have a lot of ideas. I'm just going to put another one. Well, what about life and death conflicts as well? Feeding the hungry now versus long term yeah. resilience. Well, I would actually argue you're, you're not entirely correct with regards to the short-sightedness of business leaders. Uh, one of the most exciting business leaders in Nordic countries that uh, both Matthias and I know fairly well, the largest hotel owner, Petter Stuedal, and on his business card, you turn it around, it says, no business on a dead planet. Hmm. And, and his thinking is that, you know, you know, I, I need customers in the future. Mm. And these customers have to have, uh, you know, good food, good water, good well-being. Otherwise, they won't be living in my hotels. You know, I, Nestle, you know, the Paul Polman, the, the head of this huge company, he's deeply concerned about the long term because he needs fresh water, agriculture, forest to run his entire food industry. So I, I think there's a shift happening now with, with regards to this. I mean, the, the kind of... Uh, you know, three month uh, economy we're running in terms of, of large okay. companies. Okay, and, and I'm trick, very, very happy to hear that. Uh, very happy to hear that. But is is? Uh, uh, but I'm also not sure that that actually filters down to every level of business leaders. Of so, course not. So no. they should be waking up at then. Uh, what about feeding the hungry now versus long term? So we have this situation with global injustice. We we used to have this metaphor mm. that everybody will want to have a car because that's what it means to be a middle class. So even let's imagine we we can change what being middle class globally means. Uh, is, isn't there still a conflict between people who are poor now, who need to raise their standard of living, and our long-term goal of less consumption and so on? How would you respond to that? Matthias? Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, that's a tough one. Uh, well, I mean, I just, I've done some assignments in Rwanda, for example. It's a good example where you have to balance this is the most densely populated country in Africa, and uh, when you when you go through this beautiful mountainous interior of this country in the Virungas, you can see that people are basically using every square inch of the country to to get food for their families, and they make use of everything they can to get protein for their families. Mm. And in this in the midst of this, you have again, the Virunga Mountains, where the mountain gorillas thrive. I shouldn't say thrive, because they're less than 700 alive. But for, for me, as, as, as a photographer and filmmaker, what's really interesting is to see how, in this case, in this particular case, how a living biosphere, how a living mm. rainforest can create not only a bi biological biologically resilient buffer for mankind, supporting or giving uh, the ability to have fresh drinking water. But it's also with the mountain gorillas dead versus alive, the gorillas themselves generate so much, so many jobs, so many opportunities mm. for people, so much ecotourism coming in. So it actually it's, mu it's worth much more alive than dead, this whole, uh, th this whole uh, you know, ecosystem. Yes. So this, this is simplifying things, and this is just one benchmark. But what, it's really, what it says to us, I think, is that we need to be 
fast when it comes to a tr transition where we make use of our resources in a sustainable way and we use them intelligently. But what, what's lacking at this point, I think it's one, a sense of urgency when it comes to finding those strategies and implementing those strategies. We do have the strategies, we do have the technology, um, but we're not implementing them yes, fast I, enough and, for and the I, biospheres and for people. I realize as you say that of course sense of urgency is probably key because the urgencies are different for different people. If you're struggling for survival, it would seem gloriously unfair to also ask you to look for the, the long-term survival of other richer people somewhere else who have a lot more resources to, to work on this issue immediately uh, and in the short term. Um, we need to move on to how to actually solve this. We're going to need some of that practical advice, but I'm also going to open uh, for questions from the audience. I hope we haven't shocked you into in the blue right there. Please state your name and uh, your affiliation, please. My name is Miri Spalberg, and uh, I've been the owner of a little company for 12 years. And uh, my question is regarding, the, I think, the connection of everything we have heard today. Um, it's the economical problem we are facing. It's the environmental um, uh, scary situation that we could be facing in the future. And um, um, we, we faced it from a political point of view, we faced it from an um, environmental point of view and a business point of view, but really what I feel is happening is in, in our educational system. And it's not enough to raise our children with ethical manners to, to make them aware of the variables mm. that doesn't exist in our models today, like um, the Ricardian example of uh, the maximization of profit. Mm. And now the, the VCO and the, our owners, the big company, the bank owners, when they have to, uh, when, when I as a company owner have to decide on what product shall I buy, and the product have to be as cheap as possible yes. so that I can maximize my profit in the end and give the shareholders what they want in the end. Um, yeah, I, will, right. I will have to see China, even though it's so far away and the transport cost for the environment will be huge, but according to my models and according to what I've learned, this would be the best solution. Absolutely, yeah, I understand. Do you have a, do you have a specific question? Though? My, my question here is if all of these people, all of our leaders, while on the economical basis or mm -hmm. on the political basis, are educated with the models that states that maximization of profit is it's the right money. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> yes. How can we change that? How can we calculate our um, your environmental scientific experience together with the psychological Thank you. Yeah. Theory? That, that's a very good question. Is it possible for us to do this, this, this change with the current leadership? And it's awful, the word revolution is being bandied around very carefully. Nobody wants that because bad things happen after revolutions and we don't have time for anarchy and disorder. But, but can we re-educate the current leaders or, or do we need to change them? Does it need to be the people in this room who are making the calls very, very fast? Mm. How, how do we do this? Well, I, it's not only about leadership. Of course, it is about leadership. And, and clearly, a new generation of leaders will, you know, play an incredibly important role to, to guide this transition towards a more desired future. But the key is to change, you know, the, the methods we're using to measure progress, to measure mm. what a good life is. As long as we have a paradigm that is based on economic growth, which is you know, molded around the, this, this bizarre notion that the more you destroy the planet, the better you grow. Uh, if we don't break that, we're not going to solve this. So what we need to do, I think, in, with regards to this question is both a new ethics, which can then help us change the model. And the model is really what, what has been pointed out through this discussion is, is you know, to reconnect our societies to the, to the rules of the game provided by planet Earth. So we need to have economic growth within a safe operating space. If we just do that, we'll be in a very much better position. And one way to solve, for example, the issue of maximizing profit is to say, well, if you put a full cost mm. on all the wrong things you're doing, you know, then you'll suddenly be much more incentivized to do right. But it seems that every big choice we make over the next, ten, next decades will directly or indirectly lead to some people living and, and some people dying. 
So, so I mean, um, mm. I'm sorry, but that seems to be the case. So how much in, in your, I don't know how much you teach at the Resilience Center, but, but in your academic environments, how much is this ethical aspect of the environmental, I mean, how much is the connection between the environmental issues and the sort of global justice issues part of, of the thinking also? Uh, at the courses at KTH, you mean? For instance, yeah. Yeah, uh, actually, uh, I think it's been uh, uh, happening much the, the latest years at, at KTH. We, we had have a new vice president for sustainability since 2011, and also a council on sustainability, with, which is advisory for, for the uh, president of KTH. And I think with starting this, like showing that this is important for the university, <coughs> It's also been uh, more spread uh, out to the different education systems and so on at KTH. And my division, which is uh, environmental strategic research, which is focusing on sustainable development. And so we have been asked to develop courses for, for example, civil, civil engineers in the information technology school and also for data technology students. And that's really... It's really interesting and great, a great challenge also yes. to try to, to put this, these questions into their education and also connect it to the knowledge they have. So when they come out and, and they uh, work as uh, information technology engineers, they can also reflect on the sustainable sustainability aspects in relation to choices they make and development. And I, re I realize from what you're saying also, we should of course ask every student in this room and also every student watching to take this back to their professors and say, why are we also not looking at this if, if mm. we're not? Mm. I think we have a Skype question, do we? Hello? Welcome to Crosstalks. Hello? Hi. 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 Welcome. Hi. My name is Carolina Navarro. I am a law student from Peru. I am calling you right now from Spain, and I have a question. I, yes. As you know, like my country right now, it's improving and developing. But the thing is that even if we are like becoming more and more like into the economic improvement, like people don't care about that this environmental uh, topic. What can we do in order to encourage people to actually care about the environment? And how can we work with people that are used to have as many natural resources as they always want? Like our country is full of natural resources. So they usually think that this is something, is a problem, not from our country, it's a problem like from other countries. And they actually don't get that it's a war problem. So I don't know, how can we work with them? Thank you for your question. What would the panel say? This is great, let's get practical. What do we do? How do we talk people into understanding? People, how do we talk people into caring and what do we practically do? So. I think, I mean, it, this links very much back to the last question, actually. This has been the decade of education for sustainable development for the UN. And it, all around the world, schools and universities have been doing something to embed sustainability into education. But to be honest, it's not been extremely visible in all universities. The question of who teaches ethics and who teaches about environmental education in normal engineering or normal chemistry or normal sociology degrees, it's still, you know, it's still seen as icing on somebody else's cake almost. And I think there's a couple of real challenges here. One is we need to get learning happening very, very fast now. And so it is going to have to extend beyond classrooms. It's going to have to extend beyond normal education. Mm. And so part of the answer is, again, it becomes a collective responsibility, not just the responsibility of conventional learning institutions. But I think this also links back to the earlier discussion we were having. It isn't so much about teaching the new generation. We need to teach the old generation really fast. And that's a very diff different set of challenges. They don't sit in classrooms in quite the same way. No. And and. I suppose the third challenge, if I'm going to keep adding fingers onto the list, um, is that in our education systems, we are focused on giving knowledge, not giving feeling. And so this reconnecting of kind of um, knowledge with responsibility or knowledge with the language of ethics is still a challenge. It's, it's a very big change for learning systems. How much do you think an individual can affect 
her environment just by changing her own life? I mean, does it have any, if I change, I mean, well, of course, now I work in the media, so it might show a little <laughs> farther, but if, but if, if, if somebody, if, if you change your life and, and become a role model to your peers, or at least show that it's possible to, to do some different prioritations, whatever that means, eating less meat, flying less, all of these practical things, doing your recycling, mm. does that have a real effect, or is that just rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic? Mm. Systems theory says it has an effect. <laughs> Thank you. Science says it helps. Mm. You that know, makes me we will reach a happy. critical mass. We will reach a tipping point. And you know, we certainly won't get to that stage if nobody does any change or communicates their change to other people. This is all about making connections and making the system change. Mm -hmm. And I can't see how we can do it quickly yeah. any other way. Thank you so much for your question. Thank you. <laughs> Might not have answered brilliantly. I, I, I just, <laughs> I, I'd like to add, though, how, what do we do about this paradox that the, the countries and the individuals with the most resources are the least motivated to act? Mm. Well, I'm, I'm not sure. <clears throat> I'm not entirely sure that's correct. But, but let's, uh, let's assume it is. And I, I think then what, what one has to recognize, and I, and I think this, this young uh, lady from Peru uh, kind of is a testimony to that, the, the rapidly growing economies in the world today do not have to make the same mistake as the old industrialized countries. And I would argue mm. that, particularly in Asia, that is being increasingly understood. I mean, in South Korea, for example, there's no separation of the environment here and growth here. It's all put together. There's only one plan for South Korea. It's sustainable growth. It's sustainable business. And I think there's, there's, a, there's an opportunity to start kind of building a new paradigm in, in these countries. Uh, we've just, Sarah and I, had a large delegation from Colombia here sitting on, on you know, the second world's largest kind of habitat of, of biodiverse richness. And they're so nervous now in the peace talks because suddenly all the rainforest is opening up and forest, you know, devastating forest industries is, is coming in and, and destroying the forest. Matthias may have been photographing there, I don't know. And, and they're so concerned up at the prime minister level now to immediately bypass the mistakes of the past to start preserving these systems, not because they're conserving them, but because they realize there's an asset for their own development. So, you know, there's a, there's a bypass that has to happen now to take the cherry pick the best policies around the world, the best examples, and apply them very quickly. And I think it's starting to happen. We have another uh, Skype question, I think. Do we? We do Hi, have another one. Hi, uh, Bonjour, my name is Kyle, I'm from Montreal. Hi, Kyle. Um, I have a quick question. You're all talking about uh, best practices, and we're all here tonight to obtain some kind of information that will trigger some kind of action or inspiration on ourselves. Um, I was wondering if you can point to a state, a city, a corporation, any kind of actor that you feel has championed model practices in fighting climate change or promoting resilience. And if you can explain how. I know you guys are very, it's very brief for time. Thanks. Mm. Thanks. Mm. Who would like to start? Who has been a good champion also? Well, I can, uh, I can pick one of our partner companies, maybe, that I know, uh, a, a telecom operator, Telesonera here in Sweden, who, who had uh, quite early started looking at their travel, business travel, and implemented meeting policy instead of travel policy and so on, and they actually reduced their business travel by 60% over a 10-year period, and they are really engaged in this, the whole company and uh, at all levels and so on, and I think they they really champion this and they really uh, they want, want to show this and it's actually both economic but also uh, a climate issue and they really want to spread this but it's also their technology so i, I like that a lot of uh, a lot of the best practices i think will turn out to be sort of win-win situation yeah. where it makes financial sense as well even in the short term johan best practice example well, two examples one is general electrics which is after all one of the world's if not the largest employer in the world is now internalizing green business practices so deep into its organization that the way they're portraying it, they're, they're making money, hundreds of millions of US dollars per year, and at the same time reducing their energy use, resource recycling, etc. So that's an enormous um, kind of win-win, mm -hmm. more money, more profit on sustainable practices. But the other example is, is in fact a country like Sweden, which in 1992 introduced a carbon tax of not 17 euros per ton of carbon dioxide, which was the highest level of the European trading scheme, but 100 euros. And you ask any nation that would suggest a 100 euro per ton carbon dioxide tax, they would say, you're crazy. 
We did that in 1992, and it was a revolution, sorry to say it, mm. but it was an energy revolution. It totally changed the supply of energy to renewables in the heating sector throughout the country. This is an example of a, of a nation that dis disconnected mm. um, economic growth, reduced emissions. So you can actually do it. Super briefly, Sarah, <laughs> as well. The best practice. This Our definition of community is changing. So I want to pick up on the fact that I can't think of any brilliant cities that are consistently good at sustainability, but I know just hundreds of little community level initiatives sustainable redland in the southwest of bristol is one um, and you just have to go online and look for anything that says be sustainable and there's a huge community out there to do that thank you so much kyle for this question thank you we very much. thank you we're running out of time unfortunately <laughs> luckily again we will be online uh, to chat to continue this conversation there and of course uh, Crosstalks.tv, the website, is there to continue the conversation as well. Thank you ever so much. Johan Rockström, Osa Moberi, Sarah Cornell and Matthias Klum. <laughs> A lot of questions uh, raised, few of them answered, but I think all of us have been pushed forward in our thinking. This is all we had time for this evening. We do hope you enjoyed the show. Now, if you feel you have a question but didn't get a chance to ask it, do please chat with our guests who are going backstage to answer as many of them as they can. We will be back at the end of February next year with three new thrilling topics. You can also suggest some and affect speakers uh, on crosstalks.tv. Please tune in again then. Until then, continue the conversation on our website. Thank you so much for watching. Be safe and be brave. Good night.